uh, some discussion. Oh, I guess I'm going to start over again. I'm going to go through some discussion about the broad topic of verification and validation of models. So um, up to this point, um, you've been focused on how you build models, um, the different kinds of models. Uh, we had some discussion yesterday about estimating unknown parameters. Now the question is, well, how do I tell if there are problems with my model? Um, I usually break this out into um, a couple of different kinds of discussions. One is sort of an end-to-end -end assessment, which is, I think, what you're probably very uh, familiar with, where you have some empirical data and you have a model and you want to see how well the model predicts the empirical data. And I'll have a little bit of discussion on that, uh, basically to talk about sort of you know, some robust statistical techniques to use given the fact that you're also probably using the empirical data to estimate parameter values. So you have to be careful about that, that data reuse. But the bulk of the discussion will really be based on some insights that the software industry has had over about the last 50 or 60 years about how do you build reliable systems? And the same thing here, sort of analogous for building uh, reliable models. So let me start with this brief discussion about sort of this end-to-end -end validation. Um, so it's going to be very brief. Um, I usually, in, in the course that Herbert and I teach, um, we actually have some substantial discussion about this, but I think a, a lot of that discussion is not about the conceptual part. It's about how you actually do this kind of analysis, this pro what's called cross-validation analysis um, because there's some technical details involved with it. But given the, the short time we have available, I think I'll, I'll ignore a lot of that and instead um, focus on the, uh, this issue about sort of like internal considerations of correctness. So this is the, first, the very first part, which is gonna be rather brief, probably 10 minutes or so. Um, we can have some discussion just to get sort of the conceptual part in here. Okay, so here's what we've got for our modeling workflow, sort of at a course level. We've got a, uh, we're going to build a model, you know, we sort of have some ideas about what the elements are. I think yesterday we sort of came to the conclusion, probably start simple and only add complexity where is needed. Then we're going to estimate parameters, and to estimate the parameters, we know from yesterday's discussion, we need some data. So we've got some observational data, and then we're going to do, validate the accuracy, and that's the Sorry, yes, hello. You, are you sharing your screen? I am not sharing my screen and thank you for letting me know. Okay, let me uh, go back. No, I am not sharing my screen and that is a problem. Okay, uh, let me be sharing here. Okay, hopefully, can you see my screen now? Yes. Yep. Okay, good. So let me go back briefly over the slide again <laughs> so this makes more sense. So the, this is a modeling workflow. We start with constructing the model. We're going to estimate parameters like we did yesterday. We need some observational data to do that. Um, and then we're going to really the discussion that we're having right now is about uh, validating the accuracy of then this model that was constructed in part by estimating parameters. And then we need some data to do this as well. Now, I, I think the general experience is that, you know, although there are a lot of challenges with computational techniques and, you know, sort of these analysis tools we have, by and large, um, I think we still often have a bottleneck with getting good quality empirical data. I mean, I, and I emphasize the good quality part because it's just really hard. I mean, we've got, there's lots of data. There's a lot of things we don't know about how the data is collected, which makes it so that at least for our purpose, it may be difficult. So, you know, say, aha, aha, we'll go out and collect the new data set. A lot of times it's challenging. I think it's still the case where sort of data are precious, at least for biological analyses. There are other environments, for example, I used to work at Google, and if you wanted data on uh, search queries, you could literally have billions of rows of data, and that was very readily available. And you could do things very differently than what I'm going to describe today. Okay, so here's sort of our challenge. Here's the workflow. Uh, we, we're drawing focus on this accuracy part. So the question really arises about how best to utilize data. So we've got two data sets possible here. We've got data A we use to estimate parameters. We've got data B we use to validate the accuracy. So there are a few possibilities here about what we might do. So this is called the modeling dilemma. 
So one possibility is that data set A is not the same as data set B. Matter of fact, we've either collected separate data or we got one set of data and we divided it into two. So if they're collected separately, then what we've got is a situation with basically, I mean, either we have, we have to collect twice as much data because we need two data sets, or we aren't able to estimate the parameters as accurately, or we can't validate accuracy as well. So that's sort of a challenge there. So that, that then we can save on data collection by making data set A equal to data set B. Okay, so now we have a lot more data available, but now the problem, we've got a different problem. Now, now we've got some bias over here because we're validating with the same data we use to essentially train the model. Estimating parameters is really a kind of training. And so it's sort of like we're being, you know, uh, the judge and the jury, you know, we're, you know, so we've got a bias over there. Well, um, the technique I'll describe today called cross-validation is really intended to make it so that we have a third choice. We essentially can say, we're going to use all of the data, but we're going to do it in sort of a judicious way so that we don't end up with this bias where we're doing our validation on the same data where we have estimate parameters. And it's a, it's a cute idea. It's been around, started in the machine learning world, really in statistics, probably 20 plus years ago. Um, and um, it's, a, it's a nice way of being able to maximize the available data that you have for this kind of thing. Okay, so let's describe the technique itself cross-validation. Um, by the way, out of curiosity, um, just sort of get a sense here, how many folks have already encountered the, the notion of cross-validation? Just raise your hands or vocalize whatever works. I'm just trying to get a sense of how many hands I see. I see a few. I see, yeah. Uh, fewer than I would have expected. Okay, so a few. All right. All right, probably more as I, maybe people are sort of short to react. Okay, fine. So I, I would say maybe a third, maybe less, maybe a quarter. So definitely worthwhile going over this. Okay, so here's, and, and we're only gonna, basically it's gonna be this slide, it's gonna be the summary. Just so you, you have some awareness of this technique. There, there are a lot of different tools that support this, but there's some subtleties with how you do cross-validation for time series data. And that may be something that even folks who are familiar with it may be less, uh, ha have less insight into. Okay, so here's the way cross-validation works. So here's here's my sort of, of um, little picture here for what the data looks like. Uh, it's a table, we have columns over here. The assumption is that the rows are, are, are sequential time points uh, since we're dealing with time serial data. All right, so uh, what we got over here. Okay, so here's our process over here. We're going to divide the full data set. So here's the full data set into what are called folds. Folds are going to be subsets of the data. So here, um, uh, let me show you what a little picture is. So these different colors here are folds. So I have these two dark blue, two greens. I apologize if anybody is blue green uh, color challenged, but you, know, you probably see different grays. So the first two rows are, are blue, the second two rows are green, and then we have red. So I, there are three folds here. Um, we have some discretion about how we choose folds in this particular case for convenience and showing this. It's not always that you choose them sequentially like this. You can do it in other ways. But for, for illustrative purposes, I showed you how the, um, how, uh, the folds line up. It just makes a better diagram. Okay. So then the next step is we're going to construct n training and test sets. So a training um, set is, um, so what we're doing here is you could think of parameter estimation as a kind of training. We are uh, going through an analysis with observational data to try and estimate parameters. And that's a way of training our model to get the right parameter value. So when I say training, also think of parameter estimation. So we're gonna, so here's the, the way we construct things over here. So we've got a training set. So I'm gonna use the, the dark blue and the green in, in this particular case, I have three different cases. Here I have for case one, I'm using dark blue and green to do parameter estimation. And then I'm gonna do my validation studies to see how well the algorithm works on the red test, on the red data. And then down here in case two, I'm going to use dark blue and red to estimate parameters. 
I'm going to use green to do the evaluations. And down here, I have uh, dark blue, dark green, and red, and, and dark blue. You can see that um, that's the way I do it. So then I'm going to end up with basically three different estimates for quality. So, you know, I have some parameters here that I estimated. Um, I'm going to do the estimation with this subset of the data. Obviously, I'll come up with different values for the parameters. Same here. Each one, I'll come up with a different value of quality because I have different test data. And I'm, I'm using R squared here, but you could use whatever figure of metric you, you would like. And then what I've got is now I can report the statistics as an overall uh, number. I can use the average here. I can use the, vari the uh, variance as well to show how much it varies across the different data sets. So let me pause for a second and see if there are questions on these ideas so far. And so it makes sense in terms of the motivation here as well. We want to use all of the data we can for training, which we're able to do because we consider different combinations of the data. And we want to use all the data for testing, which we do because you know the different folds are used in, in different uh, different uh, uh, steps here. Okay, all right. So far, so good. That's that's the concept of cross validation. Um, as you have the, okay. So here's the next part, and this may be something that some folks are even if you've seen cross validation, maybe a little bit less familiar with, and that is we have time serial data. Since it's time, this is an example of something that's sort of, I think this is actually a, a three-step pipeline here of um, a reaction, a linear pathway. Because we have time serial data, if we choose our folds like this, so this is the first fold, this is the second, this is the third, the problem is that within this fold, the characteristics of the um, dynamics and what we want to predict here are very different than the third fold. I mean, he, over here on the third fold, we're, we're in steady state. So if we choose it like this, you know, it's going to be hard to predict, you know, if, if, if we're training on, on these two folds over here, it could be pretty hard to predict this stuff over here. We, we haven't seen any data there. We, the parameters we've estimated in these two folds are probably not going to be pretty particularly good for over here. So the way we want to choose our folds is probably something more like this. We probably want to make sure we sample um, for each fold all of the time points. And so we'd probably alternate something like this. Right? So those are really the two key insights. One of them is this notion of you know, cross-validation that you know, allows us to use all the data. And the second one is for time series data you want to choose your folds. You don't want to do it randomly, which is typically the way um, in the machine learning problem you would choose folds. You, and especially if you have a modest amount of data, you really want to sort of do this striping is, a, is the term that's used so that um, you sample all of the uh, dynamics in each fold. Okay, that's really all I'm going to say about this. Any questions at this point? Okay. Um, right. Sorry, did you so, say you please. wouldn't do it randomly? That's correct. I, correct. If, if I have a modest data set, the problem with doing it randomly is there's a chance that one fold looks like this. You know, that it, it just has, it doesn't, it, it doesn't capture all the dynamics. You know, so if I did, if I, I ended up with a fold that didn't have anything like these early dynamics over here, then how can I train or estimate parameters if I don't have all the you know characteristics of the data? And that's why I wouldn't do it randomly. If you had it um, split <clears throat> up like you had with the second diagram, would you always do that sequentially, or would you? Um, randomly choose segments from that. Okay, so that's another possibility. You could you you can random you you can certainly incorporate some randomness within this. I mean you could have finer grains of, of folds within and then randomly choose which one within that you do. But you have to make sure your randomness is constrained in a way that you actually are going to sample all the dynamics. Okay. And that was the point. I mean my, my experience is typically we do, just don't have a lot of data. And, and so, yeah, especially if for, for a time series, 
You know, if you're getting time serial measurements or something, if you have steady state, you may be more fortunate, you can do that. But then a lot of these issues are, you know, some of the issues go away too, because it's just steady state. So does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, it does. Thank you. Okay, uh, good question. Uh, other questions on this? One right. question, maybe, okay. but I don't know if that's really re related at that point, because for, for your example here, if you have small amount of data, what is stopping you from interpolating between data points, for example? Okay, I mean, you, you, certainly, you, you certainly can interpolate between data points, and essentially then you have sort of a model of your data, really. You know, it's it's sort of a mechan it's 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 a um, you know sort of a statistical model of your data. Exactly, and you certainly can't do that. Give you right. more right. data to work with. In the yeah, it, I, and that's a thought about. I mean, it depends on. <laughs> so, for example, let let's try and be a little more concrete. Suppose I had this point here and then that point there, but I didn't have anything in between. And what you're saying is, well, I can get some more data by maybe drawing a line between these two and you know, adding in points. So what you've done is yes, you have more data, but now you've actually got another model that you've incorporated there. And it may not accurately reflect the true characteristics. I mean, if it, you know, and that's the purpose of the data for, that's used in the parameter estimation. So now you're doing the parameter estimation with really to a model rather than to the data. I mean, it may be something that the main way I see um, interpolation being used is if you need to do some type of time alignment. So I have data here and data here, but my model predicted the value here. Well, how do I compare that predicted value with the data? I can't directly because the data doesn't have it. I might interpolate. I certainly have seen that kind of thing. But I think in terms of the parameter estimation, it, it it does complicate things a bit more because now you've added in essentially another model that you've, you know, you may decide, okay, I'm not gonna do a linear approximation. I'm gonna do some sort of spline fit. Well, you're assuming that the data has a spline sort of curvature to it. And what are the parameters of your spline? And how do I validate this additional model? Those are the challenges you face. I'm not saying it's a bad thing to do. I'm just saying that those are the, those are the considerations you need to make if you go that path. Thank you very much. Okay, good, good. Other questions? Uh, great questions. All right, let me switch to the next topic. So this next topic is the one I'm going to spend the most time on today. Um, and this is really verification and validation um, from really sort of a, a software point of view and, and sort of a theme of, of some of the work that I've been doing in um, the, the at the Reproducibility Center has been around this notion of credibility of models. And the analogy has been uh, that we're sort of pursuing is sort of like, at least in you know one main thrust has been, gee, the software industry had this same problem, you know, in the, in the late 60s, early 70s, like, you know, when it suddenly people woke up and realized, hey, you know, it's not just selling hardware, it's also the software that goes with it. And how do we make it so the software is, is robust, reliable? Um, you know, back then uh, there were programs that were larger programs, but, you know, a big program was on the order of a few thousand lines. And today, you know, you're talking about millions sometimes many more than millions of lines of code. And so how do you check that that's something that will work under uh, varying uh, usage conditions? And so the software industry really went through a revolution over a period of many, uh, several decades, trying to figure out what does, you know, what can you do to try and, and assure correctness or at least, you know, minimize the impact of failures. There was a whole effort on, on proofs of correctness. Actually, in my graduate work, there were some people, this was their whole thing. Can I prove the correctness of an operating system? And, and the answer generally was that if the operating system is simple enough and um, you don't have to, um, uh, and, and you're not going to change anything, you probably can. So. The good news is, yes, you could do it. The bad news is it's probably not useful because it's going to be more complicated than that. 
So the, the general trend has been that instead of trying to prove correctness, the idea is that we're going to look for things that are wrong. And so this gets, so a lot of the focus is on testing. And so this is sort of the lead in to the next slide. So what kind of testing goes on in software uh, today? So there are what are called static errors, a static error, and we'll show what this means for biological models in a second, but uh, in software, a static error is something you can detect without running any code. You don't have to, you don't have to execute your program. You can tell that it's wrong. I mean, a simple example of a static error is a, um, um, it is, for example, mismatched parentheses or you know, some sort of syntax error, but they're more involved things that, you know, with some semantics to them. Um, unit testing, well, first of all, the unit testing requires you have a concept of what a unit is. So a unit in, in software, it's not like, you know, feet or, you know, uh, time units like that. But a unit means it's like a module or a piece. So a unit test is a test of a module in isolation. And then system testing is more end-to-end -end type of testing. A regression testing is making sure that you have, you know, something that used to work still works. Um, there are other kinds of testing that I you know, mentioned in, in passing, but I'm just trying to pick up on the ones that are most relevant here. But we're going to focus on static tests, unit tests, and, and system tests to some degree we just covered. Um, and that was this end-to-end -end testing to see if the model actually predicts what it's supposed to with some, some degree of accuracy. All right, so... Um, so let's let's talk a little bit about what's involved. It gives you some insights to what's done in software, because then the analogy to biological models becomes more clear. So this package SB Stoke that we used at least briefly yesterday for doing parameter estimation, um, it's a piece of software. Um, you know, I when I was developing this with Herbert, you know, we had to write tests. We had to consider, you know, all the usual things you do when you build software. And so it gives you a feeling for the, some of the kinds of things that are involved here. So um, the, the package that if you do a pip install of SB Stoat, you're installing a package that has about 26 files and about 6,000 6, lines of code. Now, in addition to that, something you don't install are all the tests. These are primarily unit tests, so modules basically uh, that are, you know, we're testing the modules that are over here. About 33 module files for to cover all the tests and about 4,000 lines of code. So this is a general truism in software that for every line of code you write, you're going to write a line of test. And um, for folks who you know are not you know used to writing software that others are going to actually use, a lot of times the attitude is, "Wow, that's a lot of extra time. Why am I doing that? Yeah, that that doesn't help." And and you find at the end of the day, when you're struggling with why my software no longer works, that those tests really matter. So in any case, the way you, um, you do these tests, if you think about what is a good test, so to understand what a good test is, you're not only testing each one of these circles represents you know, some kind of a, um, a module. I mean, it, 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 these are actually functions of some sort. The technical term is, is it's a, a method inside a class. But each one of these is, um, is a unit in, in the software that's going to be tested. And so you're not only testing that that thing works internally, you're concerned about, well, it depends on other things and to make sure that the other things work as well and their interactions are correct. So potentially this could be really, really complicated in terms of making sure that all these pathways are tested. And so the, the innovation with the unit testing is that you have each one of these, these test modules over here, what it does, so each one of those 33 really extensively tests to make sure that this unit behaves as one expects according to whoever is going to use it. So either what it calls or what calls it. So that, that's sort of the philosophy behind uh, the software unit tests. So, so that's what's called, this is what's called a dynamic test. I have to execute my program, in this case, SP Stoat, in order to do these tests. Now we make reference to this other one, 
other kind of test called a static test or error te a static check, which this one is interesting because you don't have to run any code to check it to do the test. An example of this, here's a, a simple example, is a linter will catch, and linter is, is the name that's, that's used for this kind of static testing. I'm not even too sure I know its origin. I think the idea was that you're sort of cleaning something up. So like lint a, is, sta is static, right? Is yeah, static. oh, good point. You know, I hadn't yeah. thought about that. Yeah, yeah, you're probably right. Yeah. <laughs> okay, well, great. Yeah, that's probably where it came from. In any case, so here's an example of this in, in a particular uh, program, a very simple one. We have an if statement here, which if that statement is true, that we chose you know, a particular right random number there, then it assigns a value to this, this variable called thing. And then down here, we're printing thing. Now, there's a problem here right away because thing is undefined unless this if statement proceeds. And a linter, can catch this kind of thing. It can do an analysis, what's called a static analysis, because it's not executing your code. It's just looking at the structure of your code and it finds it. And so um, what we're interested in doing is seeing, you know, what kinds of things, you know, what, what does linting mean for a biological model? How can I look at just the model itself and then make statements about there's something here that is potentially problematic? Okay, so um, so unit testing. I mentioned that those are mostly unit tests, and then what we're doing here is we're picking up, you know, all the references to the uh, the functions. Those are the units. Okay. All right, and this is a an example of a system test where you test it. Now, in this case, SP Stoke was tested against all the models. At, you know, I think 800 or so models and bio models, but that's really sort of analogous to what we just described before with the cross validation with the end-to-end -end test for a biological model. Okay, so what I'm going to do now is I'm going to spend some time on because this is the one I think that uh, when we start is a little bit puzzling to folks. What does it mean to do static testing? of a, um, a, a model, you know, biomedical model. And so uh, let's go through a real simple example, see if this makes sense. So here's a model, this is really simple model. We have um, ATP hydrolysis and ATP synthesis. And um, very simple, just two reactions and a few parameters. And here's what we got, all right? Well, I think there's probably, I mean, right away, you know, look at this, and there's a problem here because, you know, the um, inorganic phosphate seems to grow without bounds, sort of the uh, chemical analog to a perpetual motion machine. This is a perpetual mass creation machine. So let me pause here for just a second and, and see, does this, you know, do you, do you see that this is problematic? Do anybody have any questions about this? And you may have encountered something like this as well. This is just two reactions. Anybody have any thoughts about what it is that's wrong with this model? J1 is missing phosphate as one of the substrates. Yeah, right, right. We have we've we've treated the phosphate inconsistency, the inconsistently, the inorganic phosphate. And, and as a result, is that um, we're creating it, but we're not destroying it. What would happen out of curiosity? Suppose the situation were reversed. Suppose we included the um, inorganic phosphate over here for the um, for ATP synthesis, but didn't include it up here. What would happen then? Negative. Yeah, exactly. We'd end up with negative concentrations. And those are really, I think for most, of, at least in my experience, for most models that I build, and, and like this is just two reactions, you can make this mistake. You can imagine, you know, if you're writing a modest-sized model, like, you know, maybe 100 reactions, you know, it's real easy to, you know, include something when you shouldn't or not include it when you should. And so it's very common to come up with things that, you know, increase without bound or are negative. Both of them are, you know, telltale signs that you have a bug. All right, so you know, going on here, you folks have definitely pegged what the issue is. Is we've we've in, we've treated it inconsistently. Now these are models. You know, we're not trying to get you know exact replication of reality. We're just trying to make certain predictions. You know, based on a set of assumptions. So, you know, anybody have any thoughts about whether it's right or wrong to include the inorganic phosphates?
I mean, it, it, my opinion of this is that there's no correct answer. I mean, I can assume that there's so much inorganic phosphate in solution that, um, you know, let's just ignore it. Or, or I could say, gee, that's an important consideration in terms of the, the reaction network, and I should include it. But I can't include it sometimes and not in others. Otherwise, I'll either end up with, you know, something that increases without bound or something that goes negative. So I, I think that's sort of the general philosophy here. So, um, so this is an example of a mass balance error. Um, we could probably detect it, you know, based on, you know, looking to make sure that um, there's no missing mass in reactions. Um, so in this reaction here, you know, what's missing? Well, you know, you could argue that, you know, what this reaction is missing is it's missing the inorganic phosphate. So, um, so you can certainly write like this. We could be consistent about that, you know, and then the other way around, when we do ATP synthesis, we have ADP plus the inorganic phosphate goes to ATP. But the, the whole notion of mass balance, and this is actually a little bit of controversy in the modeling community. The whole notion of mass balance is challenging because of what I just talked about before. It sort of depends on the, the environment that you're modeling, what you can assume that's in solution, and just to make sure you do it consistently. Um, so, so specifically, what does mass balance mean here? Okay, so the problem is that even if we do this, and you're, you're, you, know, you want to literally count you know, the number of, you know, each type of atom. I'm not going to, you know, we have charge balance here, so I'm not going to worry about that, but just for mass balance, it gets complicated, right? And the, the problem is that when I have, you know, these two separate, um, you know, th these two separate species over here, you know, there's, I, I actually do to stabilize the, um, have, uh, for the inorganic phosphate, I actually have some extra uh, an extra hydrogen and a couple of extra a couple of extra hydrogen and oxygen, and that's because water is important too. Now we don't very you know a lot of times we don't even include water in the reaction, but without including water, we don't get something that really you can count up all the atoms and they're equal. Um, which then gets to the question about do I want true mass balance? Um, you know, because now my reactions start to look very cumbersome. But oh, you got the if I do, oh yes, go ahead. What's the question? Um, I don't. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, yes, yes. Uh, <clears throat> can you even talk about uh, conservation of mass since cell, uh, a cell, for example, a, a biological system is not a closed system, right? Right. It isn't. But you you could argue that the um, the individual reactions should balance. You know, a, a, except for boundary reactions. You could, you could uh, enforce essentially a discipline whereby the non-boundary reactions preserve mass. You can do that. And then that makes it so that essentially you can check to make sure that you don't have an in inadvertent error. But then of course your boundaries are, are you know, like you said, you know, it doesn't, it, 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 it's all about producing energy or, or you know, the transformations are going. So yeah, you're gonna have boundaries that don't, but you can have the bulk of your reactions preserve mass. Okay. Um, yeah, I mean that that was the thought that, and and actually that's a really good point because it, early in you know sort of the evolution of software engineering, there was a lot of discussion about how you write functions, and do you have to have functions with clear definition of what are the inputs and the outputs, or could you do things like reference you know values and other functions stuff like that. And it's really a discipline that today we just keep functions as isolated units. And you don't have to do that. You can still come up with working code that doesn't, but it's almost impossible to debug. And you can make sort of, maybe there's a counter, you know, there's sort of an, an analogy here to maybe how we might write models where we try and preserve mass balance for the non-boundary reactions. So it, it's an interesting thought. But, but that said, it's, it's still a bit of a challenge here because if you really want mass balance, you potentially have to have a lot more detail in your reaction than it necessitates. I mean, I, I, I see very few models where people want to explicitly include water, but if I don't have water in there, I'm missing a couple of hydrogens and an oxygen. So what do I do about mass balance? So this is sort of the challenge there. Okay, so true mass balance may not be desirable. This is what I was sort of talking about before. Um, yet we do, you know, the, the principle of mass balance or maintaining mass balance, that discipline could actually make it so that as we write, you know, 
really extensive models, we can avoid some silly errors because then we can have a system that automatically checks for batch balances. Very easy. You just, you know, if you have some, you know, these are all small molecules. We have, you know, Chebby or other systems that tell us what the chemical formulas are. We can just, you know, add up each atom on each side and see if we get equality. And so we could do that kind of check. That's a static check. So what do we do? That's the next question. So here's another thought is instead of balancing mass, we balance you know, chemical moieties. And so the idea is then that we have um, inorganic phosphate. Actually, there, it, you know, you have a, if you view it as a moiety, then you're a little less concerned about a couple of hydrogens or an oxygen. There are various different, you know, the you know, gamma, beta, and alpha um, uh, uh, phosphates here are all inorganic phosphates, but they have slightly different chemical structures to them. Um, and if we view it as moieties, maybe we can get by some of these things over here. Um, and so that may make life simpler. So moiety analysis is another way that you could do this kind of checking without being so rigid about the details of mass balance. So um, here's a simple idea over here for looking at moieties like adenosine moiety and an inorganic phosphate moiety. We compare, you know, we've got ATP, ADP, and the inorganic phosphate. We can do the counts over here. And so if we look at the reaction, we get equality based on the moieties, not on the, uh, the actual um, atoms. The, the problem with doing this moiety analysis, it, you know, although it has appeal, is that we don't have moiety databases like we do for the chemical formulas, uh, the, 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 you know, like the small molecules like Chevy. And so you know, what is the database that we, we do the lookup so that we can actually you know, construct this table and do this calculation? So that, that's sort of the challenge there with, with taking that approach to, again, it's a static analysis of, of our models. So um, that basically uh, gives you uh, that assessment over the challenges with moiety analysis that requires a separate database. Okay, so um, here's one approach that actually is pretty widely used um, in, well, widely used is probably a strong statement. For, for those folks who are trying to do um, static analysis of biological models, um, there's some groups in Europe in particular that do this. They will use this particular technique. Um, it's something called stoichiometric inconsistency. I'll explain what that means in a second. Um, but uh, this has actually been for, around for a while. The um, paper, which actually, this was, um, the technique was actually developed even a little bit earlier. But so this paper is, you know, 14 years old. Um, and so this technique has been around for a while. Um, the idea is not so much to ensure mass balance. The idea is more, can I detect if I've used, um, a, a, if I've written the, the chemical formula, the, the reactions in an inconsistent way? So it's this weaker condition, you know, maybe I, you know, I don't have to have my phosphates in there if I think they're in solution. I can have, you know, reaction that ADP goes to ATP, that's okay. As long as I'm consistent, I don't sometimes include the phosphate and sometimes not. So that's the idea of the stoichiometric inconsistency. So how do we actually check for this? Now, this is the part which gets to be very interesting because this particular technical approach doesn't even require any sort of knowledge database, any knowledge of what these, these chemical species are, uh, which is actually sort of amazing. Um, and yet it can, it can still help as we build larger models looking for inconsistencies. Um, again, it won't, it won't help you in terms of true mass balance, but it'll help you. In, so here's an example. I mean, like this simple pairing of reactions over here ATP goes to ADP plus phosphate, you know, and then, you know, this is the um, a hydrolysis and then the, um, the synthesis. It detects that um, there's an inconsistency here because it says, look, what I'm trying to do is assign some value of mass. It's got to be a positive number. That's all I ask. It can't be zero. It can't be negative. I got to find a positive number that I assign to ATP, ADP, and P. And, and I don't even have to know what these things are. It could be any, any chemical species. I don't care. But can I assign a number to these three entities here such that 
I can make it so that the number associated with ATP is going to be the sum of these two, and the number associated with ADP is equal to ATP. And you can see right away that as long as we're talking about positive numbers, there's no way I can do this. Because over here, ATP has to be larger than ADP because P is non-zero. It's a positive number. Okay, so obviously it can't be both greater than ADP and equal to ATP. So, so that's basically the principle behind this um, is can I find those kinds of inconsistencies? The way this is done, and I'll give you sort of a, a brief tour of the way it's done because um, sort of an interesting insight here. The, the way it's done is um, actually um, using uh, a technique called linear programming. And I don't know if you know, how many folks have encountered this before. It's a kind of optimization technique. We spoke a little bit about optimization before. I, I give you a feeling for how it's structured. It's just sort of interesting to see how you can do this analysis without really knowing anything about the chemical species. Uh, so if we go here, so there's no assignment of positive. So that's the root idea is you're going to assign can I find any positive? Well, how do I how do I even express that? You know, what it, what it is. So you're going to construct mass equations for the reactions. So, so R1, we're just assigning, we're saying that, that there's some number M1, which is a mass, it's gotta be positive. That's gonna be uh, the one for ATP. And that equals M2 plus M3. And, and this one over here says M2 equals M1. And then you determine if there are any values that are greater than zero. And if not, you, know, you see that there's nothing that exists. So the way the formulation works here, so you have a, you know, here's a more general one where, Again, I, I mean, this is one of the challenges is that I don't know how much this has been discussed already, but one of the big challenges in the modeling is knowing what the chemical species are. So some models will actually label things. You know, you'll see glucose or ATP or, you know, um, uh, fructose, you know, six uh, bisphosphate or one six bisphosphate and you know, things like that. You, you'll, you'll actually see that name, but this here, you have no clue about what these things are. So without what are called annotations, you probably, you can't even do this notion of, of true mass balance, but you can do the stoichiometric inconsistency analysis. So you talk a little um, bit about uh, annotation of, of things like that. Okay. So. Okay, and that's a, that's a problem. That's another reason why this, this stoichiometric inconsistency approach is powerful because you can actually do it with the amount of information available in many models. So I'm going to do a little mathy stuff right now, and just to sort of give you a feeling for how this is done, you get a sense of it. So here on this column over here, I'm going to describe what is a linear program. It, it, the, the term program here is a little problematic. Um, you know, this is program as a mathematician understands it, which is not how you and I understand it. Um, so program means that I'm sort of specifying something that I can solve. So here's, here's my specification. This is what's called the objective function. An objective function is something you're going to minimize. So I have some constants, um, a sub k over here, which for us, is this is going to end up being one, so you can ignore the a's, but it's the m's. These are the masses. So I want to find a bunch of masses that um, basically are going to meet these constraints over here, that um, the that I'm going to choose values of the um, these coefficients over here for these masses, so that I always get sums of zero. Now, what this is going to be over here is this is going to be a representation of our um, uh, basically the stoichiometry of the reactions, and then uh, this is going to basically each one of these constraints is going to be a reaction, and then I want to know if there's some values of the ends that are positive that will uh, actually give these numbers here. I'm actually not going to care so much about the minimizing, but I am going to do what's called a feasibility uh, problem, where I'm just trying to see if I can get the numbers that sum to zero. So let's see how that works over here. So um, the coefficients here in this case are either going to be one or minus one. So here my coefficient is minus one. That's the B1K. Uh, for the first reaction, for our B11, first reaction, first uh, molecule, this is you know, a one here for B12, uh, B13, and this, uh, this one over here would be a B22, which would be uh, a minus one. And I want to see if, can I find coefficients such that um, I can actually make these constraints be satisfied? And that's the whole 
way that stoichiometric uh, inconsistency works for linear programming. It's particularly appealing because linear programming is something that was developed, I think it was just after World War II, where it was really refined. Um, and at that point, and, and I guess today, you can literally handle millions of variables. So this scales extremely well. It's done with very efficient matrix uh, linear algebra operations. Uh, so we can do very, very big models. So this is the feasibility problem. And if you can't solve the feasibility problem, then you have a, you know, what happens is you have a stoichiometric inconsistency. Okay, so I give this to you as sort of like a starting point for, hey, there are some very reasonable things we can think about in terms of doing static analysis of models. Now, there is a huge gap here with what we've presented so far. Yes, it, it's great because it doesn't require any knowledge of the chemical species and annotations are sparse in models, sadly. So that's great. And yes, it can find certain number of errors, but suppose I had a model with just, let's say a hundred reactions. No, no, modest size, not a big deal. And now what happens is I run this, this you know, stoichiometric inconsistency analysis, runs real fast, and it comes back and says, you have an error. And my question to you is, what do I do next? Any thoughts? Ask for a better error. What would you do? Yeah, well, it's more than better error message. Yeah, yes, <laughs> you'd like to have a more error message, but the problem is the nature of this analysis doesn't tell us where the problem is. Yeah. It's fundamental to the technique. It does not tell us where the problem is. That, that's called, so a, a, a technical term for that is, is problem isolation. I have not isolated where the problem is. And for e, you know, even 10 reactions, this is non-trivial to figure out, much less 100 reactions. So, okay, well, so what do we do? So this is where there's been some more, some more work done. This is some work that um, a, um, a, a student I've worked with for a little while, Wu Sub Shin, um, did this work a couple of years ago. Um, and it's something, uh, he developed an algorithm he called GAINS. It's a graphical approach to this. And the idea of the graphical approach to this is that it will retain enough information so that you can isolate which reactions actually participate in the stoichiometric inconsistency. Um, so here's sort of a sense of it. Here's the kind of output you would get is that it essentially constructs a proof about why it is that this is inconsistent. So the argument is always an argument about why all the constraint, which constraints cannot be satisfied. So it says that, um, the mass of ADP is equal to ATP because of this reaction. So right away, I know which one reaction it's involved. However, that's inconsistent with what's going on in this reaction, which says that ADP has to be less than ATP. So in this case, I only have two reactions. So yeah, I, I didn't help much. But you can imagine in a, you know, a bigger network with many reactions, I could, I could isolate much better. Um, so we have about an hour to go. I will give you a little feeling for how this works, but not a lot, because I don't want to uh, consume too much time with this. We have some other things we can look at as well. But I'll give you a sense for this. Essentially, what it's going to do is it's going to construct a dependency graph between reactions based on what constraints are implied by that reaction. So let's sort of tease that apart. So let's take a look at this reaction here, V13. It says C10 plus C154 um, in combination will produce C160. So what that means in terms of mass is that C10 has to, be has to have a mass that's smaller than C160 and C154 has to have a mass that's smaller than C160. So I've got these two inequalities over here. Um, now, when I have what's called a uni-uni reaction, then I've got that their masses have to be equal. So this gives me some constraints where the graphical part comes in is sort of at two levels. First of all, anything that has equal mass is put together, sort of lumped together into like a, a pseudo species that consists of many different species. So this becomes sort of a pseudo species where they all have the same mass. Any reference to any one of these, it has the same number associated with it. 
These guys over here, the way their relationships are indicated is by an arc in a graph. So the, this becomes a node, These become, this becomes an arc. So an arc from C154 to C160 means that C154 has a mass that's less than C160. And so you will go over here. So here's an example of that, that node that got constructed. And here's from V1, V13, it says that C10 is less than C160 and C154 is less than C160. So that means I've got an arc from C154 right here, because that's the node for C154, to C160, which goes back to the same node over here. So I have a loop. Well, what does that loop mean? That loop means that I have an, as something that's less than itself. So I have an error. So basically the way the graphical analysis works is it looks for loops or cycles in the graph. And it then analyzes the cycle to produce that proof about or explanation about why it is that there is a stoichiometric inconsistency. Okay, let me pause for a second and um, see if all that sort of made sense in terms of, and, and so at that point then, you know, you've got a subset of reactions to look at. So then that gives you the whole thing basically. Oops, went too far. Let me pause for a second, because I spent a lot of time on this. I think that this notion of mass balance or stoichiometric inconsistencies um, is probably a, a very natural area to focus on for static analysis of reaction networks. Um, and just sort of get a feeling from folks about this resonate with you or, you know, is there value there? Um, obviously, this is something you could do with um, constraint-based models that do not include kinetics, only have the mass transfer part as well. So that, that has sort of appeal too. Any, any comments or thoughts, questions? Uh, I, ha I, have a, I have a question. Uh, so you said that the algorithm is uh, searching for this, uh, uh, this cycles, right? But there right. is, as, does it search for cycles just for the, for to search inside of them for inconsistency or cycles are, I don't think that cycles by themselves are a bad thing, right? They, they're going to well, happen as, no matter as, what. So a cycle in this sense, and I know there's a lot that I'm sort of dumping on you all at once. A cycle in this sense, so, so each arc from a node to another node, like this from C10 to C160, that has the semantics that C10 has a mass that's less than C160. That's what that means. An arc, and that's the way the graph is constructed. You only have an arc from C10 to C160 if the mass of C10 is less than the mass of C160. So if I have a cycle, that means I have that A is less than B, less than C, less than A. How can that be? How can A be, you know, oh, you know A I, be less I than see. itself? I yeah. see. So the I cycles mean, are generated when you have like a, like a comparison uh, that goes back to the same, uh, the exactly, same variable. Okay. Exactly, right. Okay. And, and the challenge there in terms of explanation is you don't know for sure what part of that cycle needs to be broken. I mean, you can't say it's reaction, you know, it's not, it may not be this reaction that's the problem, maybe another reaction, but it should be some reaction in that cycle. I see. And so, yeah, and so at that point, you're not pointing to, you know, reaction, you know, V13, but you are saying that out of the 100 reactions you've got, there are three that you need to look at because they create a cycle. I see. I was just kind of confused because generally you need your reaction system to be a closed system, but uh, this is a different notion that... Uh... Exactly, is, exactly, okay. right. This I is, just, I just don't right, right, right. Yeah. yeah. No, 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 it, it is, mm -hmm. right. I'm, yeah, exactly. And that's part of it. I mean, I know there are a lot of sort of related concepts, but this is, you know, exactly. And this is really a different interpretation of the reaction network. Got you. Thank you. Okay. Oh, thank you for the question. Uh, other questions at this point? I mean, just to underscore what you just said, it, it, this is puts no constraints on the reaction network. It's not like I have to have a reaction network that, you know, has to have boundaries or anything like that. It's not putting any constraints on it. It's just a matter of saying that I, you know, I have to make it so that the masses 
you know, have to be positive. And if they're positive, I better not have a cycle because then something in that cycle either has to be negative or have something else less than itself, which makes no sense. Okay, if there are no other questions on this, let me try and show, and I'll, I'm gonna spend a second or so showing you, um, there is some, a program here, a package actually, that you can use to do this kind of analysis. And it's actually pretty easy to use. Let's spend a second on that so that you get a feeling for it. Okay, so if you go to the um, files for today's class and you look at the one on static testing, open up that guy. Okay, um, let's see, I'm gonna do this with this so you get to see the table of contents. Um, and let me just get everything loaded there. So the packages it's going to install, it'll install a Telerium because we're doing some simulations um, and it installs SBML Lint. So SBML Lint is this package that was referenced in that publication that uh, um, I showed you. And, and Wu Sub Shin is the primary author of this package. So um, what we've got here, uh, there's a little, you know, some of the dependencies here. The, the main thing that is going to be of interest to you is going to be this function lint in the SBML uh, lint package. So that's the main thing you have to include. The usual thing with you know including the shared codes over here. So all that stuff, just the usual stuff. Okay. So uh, let's see how you you use this pack. I and mean, some of this I'm sort of repeating from the slides. I'm not going to go through all that. This is basically a similar thing as what we went through before about detecting mass balance errors. And you saw an example of running this. Let's just show this to so that you can see uh, how the the function actually works. So this is let me just repeat the model over here so that you can see it. So if I just say uh, print uh, ATP. Uh, one model. Okay, and so that you get to see that. So here's that model there. It's just two lines. And then if you um, run this and say mass balance check, and I'm not sure what the default option is. I thought it was the, the games algorithm that we subdeveloped, but you know, specify that anyway, and you've got it. So you've got the antimony string here. Um, and I think you do you know that for anything, any model that you have in Roadrunner, so you could have read it from an SBML file, you can always convert that to antimony. I don't know if you knew that or not, but you can. Um, yeah, and there's a simple function. Session, so. I, yeah, get the antimony or get current antimony. We'll yeah, get antimony, I think. Yeah. yeah, so you can always get an SBML model into the antimony format, and then you can do this analysis. So what it does then, this, this lit function that I showed you how to import before, if we run this again, it'll generate the same thing as before, hopefully. All right, so it's doing it. So now I did, have I finished installing? I guess I did. And then it, it shows you, you know, this is the same output that you saw from before. So that's really all that's involved. Um, let's see here. So um, you can see what the analysis uh, brought up. So this is that model uh, also from before. Um, where we're looking at something a little more complicated. Now we have uh, several more reactions. Here's the analysis that it did against the same format. You just put in the model string over there, run the lint, and uh, there it's would go out. And so what it did was it, it, it again, this is sort of the, the argument it's gonna make. It's gonna you know, talk about which masses are the same. And then sort of the punchline, the however, is going to be where there's an inconsistency. And so that means then that you can't have the equality. So I have um, a quick question from the, the chat. Just yes, to, right. How do you handle boundary species? Do you handle boundary species just like everything else, or do you do something special with them? Uh, boundary species, uh, in essence, get ignored. And so that's always, that's a, this is a fundamental challenge with uh, the stoichiometric inconsistency analysis. Okay. It said, essentially, you don't know. You know, so essentially, they get ignored. Um, and whereas if you were doing mass balance, of course, it would look differently, you know, then we could, I mean, actually mass balance is sort of interesting because if you actually knew what the atoms were that were involved, you could also get fantastic resolution in terms of problem isolation. You could specify an individual reaction that was problematic because you look for where the count of atoms on one side is not equal to the corresponding count of those atoms on the other side. 
uh, of the reaction on the you know products you, versus reactants. Do you special case like synthesis and degrade degradation? You don't have to. I mean, it, it works for yeah. I, I, what I mean, synthesis would be Christian? from nothing, right? Like a reaction that like oh, oh okay, yeah, yeah, right, one, right. right. Yeah. So, so you can't do mass balance and analysis for if you're talking about boundaries, right? Okay, so, have you, so, if you have boundaries you, anywhere, right, by you definition, can't do the whole right? Model. You're either destroying something or, or you're creating it. You know, right. it evaporates or it, it it gets you know poof. It it it, it appears. Right. So you can't do mass balance on those guys. So you couldn't. Like take those out of your system and assume everything else works except for that. Well, that's essentially what what would happen. That that's what yeah. people do when they do this, you know, atomic level mass balance. Is yeah. they essentially they identify the boundary reactions and ignore them. Okay. Right. So is, is do you if you find boundary reaction if you find anything with the boundary species do you ignore that whole reaction then? Exactly. Okay. That cool. must be an issue then because I didn't realize that. Because you can have something yeah. like, let's say A is a boundary. You can have A plus B gives A. That's right. a violation. Yeah, that's it. That's a good. That's a good point. Right. I mean, there there are checks that you could still do on a boundary. That's true. Uh, they, really, what they the ones that I've seen, I'm aware of. They own. They just ignore it. Mm. Okay. I mean, it. You know, it's still it's still helpful in terms of you know errors that are found, but it's probably not as comprehensive as it could be. Um, okay, and just to give you a feeling about you know runtimes, you know stuff. Okay, so here's the 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 Wolf model, um, the um, you know with the the cyclic um, oscillation with the oscillations, glycolytic oscillations. So yeah, it's not a huge model; it's like ten reactions, but it's a lot more involved. Um, so you get a feeling for um, oh, actually I didn't do this one, so we can do this. Great. Okay, so let's get a feeling for what's involved there. So the easiest way to do anything in programming, of course, is you copy something that's pretty close and then paste it. That's the easiest way to do it. So the name of the model is Wolf Model. That sounds good. So if I just uh, down here add some code and then copy this. Okay, so I don't want that. I want Wolf Model. Wolf should tell me. Model, there we go, wolf model. Okay, see what happens when I run this guy. See if there are any um, errors here. Okay, so it found no errors. Um, it didn't find any model. Uh, you haven't run something that created the wolf model, it looked like? Well, oh, no, no, it, no it, okay, it, that's a string. Yeah, that's yeah. the string. That actually, that's what I printed up here. Right. But okay. you know what's in, yeah. Um, yeah, and so it's sort of uh, sort of interesting. I mean, one example that you know what we could do something a little bit simpler here, just to give you a feeling for this. So this had a whole bunch of errors. I mean, it's sort of interesting to see what it is you have to do to fix it. I'm mean, actually given the time, I don't think I will go through that because there are other things I want to get to. But I mean, then there's a whole question about when you do have errors, what do you have to change to fix it? And so, you know, the reactions involved. So somehow you have to do something that affects these three reactions. Okay, let me stop here. So I have time for other things. A any questions on this is what, you know, I'm not gonna do more on static analysis. So if you have questions about static analysis, uh, now is a good time to ask. Um, and of course, other kinds of static analysis you could do. We're looking at mass balance. You could do charge balance. You could do, um, what are called blocked reactions. A blocked reaction is a reaction that uh, has zero flux because one or more chemical species in its kinetics are always zero. You know, so you can imagine if my reaction is A goes to B and A is always zero, then that reaction is blocked. Uh, there are also what are called orphan species. Orphan species are species that uh, have zero concentration throughout the simulation. So those are examples of you know other kinds of static tests that, that potentially can be done. Questions? Okay, let me go on to uh, the next part. So the next part, so this is st static. So you know the, the natural counterpart to static is dynamic. Um, and dynamic is going to look a lot more like what you probably are familiar with from. And those of you who write uh, much in the way of software, when you're writing codes. Uh, and so this has natural analogy to, to unit tests and that notion of, of unit testing. 
So let's think about this for a little bit. Um, I'm going to run this while we're talking. So we get all there are um, dependencies in place. So if we have, um, let's see here. I'm going to need a picture to be able to do this. Let's see. Let me go back to the. Um, well, that's running because that that was containing my picture. Uh huh. Where is my picture? Do I have a picture over here? Oh, you know where my picture might be? It might be, um, I think, it may be right over here. And let's see here. I think I had a picture, not there, not there. I wanted something, I may have to wait for that to run then. I thought I had a pic picture to show you. Yeah, okay, it should be done. Uh, so let's see if we got the picture now. Now we've got the picture, great. Okay, so, um, so here's our model right over here. Um, our model is S1. You know, we have this, this linear pathway that S1 uh, produces S2, produces S3. Uh, we're going to assume that we start with a fixed amount of S1. There's no boundary here. Nothing new is coming in. So the mass over time goes from S1 to S3. So um, what are the kinds of things we're sort of expecting from this in terms of you know, that kind of pathway? So we're sort of expecting, if we start with all the mass in S1, one thing we're expecting is that at the end of the simulation, how much mass of S1 is there? Any thoughts on that? None. Exactly. And, and how about, as long as I got you there, how about for S3? What do you expect? Um, so at the end of the simulation, probably. We've, we've run all the reactions that can be run. Yeah, yeah. it depends because your S1 is going to run out. But S1 will run out, but then all the mass becomes S3. Yeah. All right. Okay. Is there a typo in? Uh... Where 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 are you? Oh, uh, I was looking at the cell six. Not on cell six yet, are you? Okay, all, all right. right. So oh, so I that's sort of did. yeah. Okay, yeah. You you probably saw the error. <laughs> yeah yeah okay. See I should do. You got you right. <laughs> so um, so so one expectation is just as you were saying, S one is going to you know decrease monotonically to zero. S three is going to increase monotonically to. To, to the amount that was initialized for S1, which in this case was 10. And S2, you sort of expect it's going to do something in between. It'll start to increase and then it will decrease. It'll increase while we're you know, producing more S1, but then it'll decrease. Okay, so here's an example of an incorrect model. So we, we, we had a typo here. Everybody see the typo? I, I think Herbert caught it right away and Yes. I wanted to, wanted, to, wanted to fix my mistake, but I intended for there to be a mistake. Okay, so if you look at the output over here, this is not what we expected for the pathway. You know, we see S1 decreasing, we see S3 increasing, but S2 is zero for the entire time. And the reason for that is we have a typographical error over here. Our kinetics are wrong. Instead of S1 being um, in the kinetics for the second reaction, I'm sorry, instead of S2 being the kinetics, because that's the, the reactant, um, we have S1, typographical error, happens all the time. But that resulted in this error in the model. So this is an example about basically very analogous to how people write unit tests for programs. They start with, what are my assertions about how this program should behave? In this case, you know, our program, the analogy is to a simulation, what we expect from the simulation output. We expect these three outcomes or assertions. S1 increases, S2 first increases and then decreases, and S3 will, um, I'm sorry, S1 decreases monotonically and S3 increases monotonically. And, and we've, what we would like to do is then use these assertions, have a mechanism Whereby, or, or the software term is framework, whereby we can translate these assertions into tests that will check the output. Basically look at this data here that gets produced by the simulation and see, aha, you have failed that second assertion, this one right here, because um, S2 does not increase and then decrease. It just remains at zero. 
And that's the whole point of, of this validation, this dynamic validation. Now, we're actually running the simulation. So that's the analogy to you know, software unit tests. We actually run the codes. Well, our analogy is we're running a simulation. We're looking at the outputs. We're analyzing the output from the simulation. And we're saying, you know, we have violated one or more assertions. Let me pause for a second and see if that framework makes sense to folks. I know some of you have had, you know, have considerable experience with building software, others have less. And so for those who've had less, this may be something new. Okay, all right. So if there are no questions on this point, so really the rest of what I have to say, I'll, I'll develop over the next probably 15 or 20 minutes, is gonna be um, how do we instantiate in software this capability to do this dynamic testing of models? And keep in mind that you know, we've assumed, you know, I assumed here that you have these assertions. I mean, and this is true if you're writing software unit tests. You got to figure out what your assertions are. If you're calculating prime numbers, you have a um, code that's going to calculate, uh, you know, prime numbers between one and a hundred, and you want to, you know, write some tests for that code. You've got to figure out, well, what am I testing for? You know, you might know the answer for some things. Like I know seven is is prime, but twenty seven is not prime. Might do that kind of check. Um, I might say that, gee, if I have, you know, a larger number that I'm looking for, you know, say if I want to find all the primes less than a certain number, that's what my function does. So if that number that I submit to this function is a larger number, then it should have at least as many primes as a smaller number. So that might be another kind of test. So those that you've got to come up with the test. We're not we're not automating necessarily the test. Come on, here are the tests we came up with over here. But once you have those tests, how do you actually instantiate this capability for, um, for being able to check that those assertions are, are actually um, hold? Okay, so um, there's a corrective one. Okay, so let's, let's, start with that. let's start with this thing about these assertions. Okay, any thoughts about what we might do? So what we're gonna be, we're gonna write some code. And what this code is gonna do is gonna check we want to be able to check each one of those assertions. So that means that we've got some output. So what's our output over here? Well, output over here is data. What does data look like? Let's take a look and see what data looks like. Okay, so if I just take a look and see what data looks like. So data is what's called in a, a named array. Um, sort of, uh, interesting structure there's i don't know did you talk about data frames at all no i think you okay. talked about data frames didn't you? i talked about data frames, but that's been one, it yeah yeah, yeah, yeah i'm same. the only one okay so um named arrays are useful are nice because they actually give you the names of the columns the unfortunate thing about them and, and they're very computationally efficient that the unfortunate thing about them is that as soon as you do something to a named array, you lose this information you know, about the, um, the column name. So a lot of times what we, we want to do, because our assertions are about particular columns, is we're better off having this in a different form uh, called a data frame, which I mentioned before. It's more like a table. So that's our named array. And if I go down here, it's sort of longer than I probably want. OK. So I can create something called a data frame. I'm not sure. I think I may, I think I already have imported. It's, it's for, I'll import it anyway. Um, so there's a package called pandas, which I highly recommend that um, you take a look at if you haven't already. And so you have to import the pandas package. And then I can create a data frame. I'll call it data underscore DF from the named array. So I can just say pd.data frame of data that'll give me a named array that'll give me a data frame and if i can take a look at data underscore data underscore df oh actually there's one other thing i want to do is that the name of the these columns up here that i see those columns up there 
those actually are in a variable inside the, uh, the, the named array data dot call names. And I can say that I want the columns of my data frame to be the same as those, those columns. So now if I look at this, I get something that looks a little nicer. It's a table and this is a data frame. Now, the only thing that's sort of odd here is I do have these brackets around that. I may want to do something with the brackets. Um, we'll see if that's necessary. We can deal with that later. But by and large, if I'm going to process some data and do some analysis, I'd rather work with a data frame than a named array. However, if I'm doing something like parameter estimation where efficiency is king, I would never use a data frame because it's very inefficient computationally because it provides so much flexibility. Okay, so, so far so good. All right, so the first thing we wanna do Let's see how we could possibly uh, enter, uh, in, be able to implement these checks. So we got to check that S1 is monotone decreasing. And now we can get to S1 because we have this data frame. We know how we can get to data, uh, S1. So we we'll going to make sure that this is monotone decreasing. And we've got to make sure that S3 is monotone increasing. So uh, any thoughts about a function that might be good to write so that we can do that kind of check? By the way, I'm asking you folks questions because I know it's getting towards the end of the day and I'm trying to make it so that you can be a little more active rather than passive. So, um, you know, anybody who wants to answer, I appreciate it. Just sort what of, was the question, sorry? Okay, the question is, I want to be able to check that I have to, I have, two, two, I have three assertions that I want to be able to check in code. I want to check that oh, S1 nice. is, decreases monotonically this is increase and decreases, and this increases monotonically. So my question is, what code should I write? Because I want, let's start out with the, you know, decreases monotonically and increases monotonically. So I know that I want to write a function where the output is a Boolean, true or false. And I, they, I'm going to input some data. I've got the data, it's data frame, but what is the function that's going to, to check this? What I will do is uh, for S1, I would test if, uh, I would integrate the derivative and test if it's negative. For the S3, I would integrate and test if it's positive. And for S2, I would integrate the second derivative and test if it's negative because you have a peak, something like okay. that. Okay, I, I think that's a great starting point. Now, I think um, um, integration, of course, you know, literally doing integration is probably um, something a little more um, a challenging in, in the code, probably not absolutely necessary. And we have discrete values, but the idea is a great one. We need tests for, for monotonicity and you've got exactly the right idea. You wanna know, look at the sign of the first derivative and then for you know something which is, you know uh, in this case, concave, you're looking at the sign of the, the second derivative, which is, which is great. Something simple that you can do inside, uh, you know, in, in, in code, it's just look at differences, which is really, you know, the discrete approximation to differentiation. So, um, so you can do differencing here by just doing, um, we talked yesterday briefly about slicing arrays. So what's going on here is that we've got a bunch of values that are coming in. Um, and so um, in our case, the values are gonna be from that data frame. It's just a sequence. And we're looking to see, is it monotone? And that uh, when direction is one, we're looking for monotone increasing. And when direction is minus one, it's for monotone decreasing. And so what we're doing is basically what you just said is we're looking at a discrete approximation to, um, to the derivative. So this is a slice which starts at the second value. Remember Python indexes from zero, starts from the second value and then subtracts from that the first value and so on all the way to the end. And you have to take care of the endpoints, right? Because this, you know, the size of each one of these real arrays is one less than the size of the original array. And then what you're looking for is to make sure that all of the values, those differences are greater than zero. You're just looking for the sign. So that's this function is monotone. Now, something I highly recommend as you're writing any codes is that you have a bunch of tests inside the same cell where you write the, the code so that you can check to make sure both that it works and that if something changes over time, it, it you know, works correct. It, you, you detect the error if, if there is something that's changed. So for example, if we have as the set of values, 
zero, one, two, and three. That's an increasing sequence. That's monotone increasing. So if the direction is one, I expect that that is monotone will be true for that. And for this one over here, it's zero, one, two, or zero, one, two, one. Okay, that's not monotone. So it doesn't really matter, you know, which direction you take, that should return false. And this one would be monotone decreasing. So those are three tests for three different variations on the code. And we see that actually, you know, what I usually do here is I also like to put at the end over here. Why is that? I guess my cursor isn't there. All right, let's go out and we'll go back in. Now, oh, it's in some weird mode. Now let's see if it works. Okay. I usually like to play print okay, you know, so that I know that um, it actually executed as opposed to just something happened in the cell. See, now I've got a positive response. Okay, so that is monotone. Okay, so that takes care of, of assertion one and three, you know, for corresponding to species one and species three. How are we going to do species two? So species two should have, you know, increase and then decrease. So it should have this thing where initially, and, and we don't know where this peak is. It could be anywhere. Any you thoughts? can just test it if, it, uh, if the peak exists. Exactly. Test if the peak exists. Right. And then, and then once you find that, then um, you make sure that it's monotone increasing going to the peak and monotone decreasing going down from the peak. Now, the one thing you know about the peak is this should be the maximum value. So whatever the maximum value is, you got to, you know, if, if, if it is in fact a, um, you know, of this shape, that maximum value would define, you know, the end of the range where it's increasing and the beginning of the range where it's decreasing. Now, if it has, you know, you could have, you know, other shapes that also have, you know, obviously they'll have a max, but they won't have that characteristic. And so basically that's the approach is to say, okay, we're looking for, is it concave? Then what we're gonna do is we're gonna find uh, where the value, I guess this one, oh, this is a very, okay, this is a bad way to do it. I guess what I did here is I tested for every possible value. It'd be much easier just to go to the peak, go look for the maximum value. But what I did here was something a little bit different, which um, could be made much more efficient. It considers every value to possibly be the peak and then looks to see if you have the right characteristic there. And if you never have the right characteristic where it's monotone increasing going to that value and monotone at that time point and monotone decreasing afterwards, then it, uh, it fails. And so again, there are tests. All right. Hopefully that all makes sense. Went through that sort of quickly, but hopefully it makes sense in terms of this part of what it means to develop tests for, for the dynamic test. So you have to have code functions, Boolean, the return Boolean values that correspond to each one of your assertions. And if you do that, then you have a way of analyzing um, your, your code that comes out. So here's you know, more examples of that. Okay. May I have right. a question? So that's, please. Regarding the last example of concave, finding yes. the maximum within, uh, why you not just check if there is maximum that it's not on on the zero or the last first or the last observation because if there is maximum somewhere in between then it has to be okay right well the thing is that you could have a maximum in between but it could go like up and down if he's following my cursor you know like yeah, I, I could, you know, okay. would still have yeah. yeah i could have multiple p yeah. right so that doesn't mean that's really concave Okay, yeah, I see that. Yeah, yeah, that that that's the thought. But I mean, your point is well taken, and it, it point it, it, in terms of it requires some thought to come up with the right functions, you know. And and this has direct analogy for the challenges with writing tests for software and why it really does double the time to implement your code by including tests because you have to be thoughtful about how you construct the tests. Okay, so that's step one is have ways to test your assertion. Now, the second step is really has direct analogy and actually is even going to leverage existing software capabilities for doing unit tests. And what I'll do is um, just briefly give you a feeling for what this is, this existing infrastructure. So you have a sense about 
you know, how you can take advantage of it. There is a Python package called unit test. This is a package, you know, like Tellarium is a package and SPSTOAD is a package. This is just another Python package. And you use this um, Python package to um, be able to create um, a, a new Python module, which is going to be a test module. But this test module is actually going to test the assertions you're making about your model. So let's go through this and see what all is involved with creating such a, such a, a module or file to do that. So obviously you have to import unit test. Um, the second thing that you have to do Okay, what I, which I'm not showing here, um, uh, apparently, is you also need, if this is going to be a, a separate module, so I'd want to import Roadrunner, or I, I'm sorry, uh, Telerium. Telerium as T-E, okay. So what I'm going to do here, and then somehow I have to, I mean, in this case, I'm assuming that the model is a global constant. I mean, obviously if this is in a separate file, you know, you, you probably would get it from a file rather than just a string inside a module, but um, I'll leave that alone for right now. So there are a few parts to then this code that you write in the module. Um, some of them are basically boilerplate. For example, this line right here, you're defining a Python class. For those of you who know what that means, for those who don't know what that means, don't worry about it. You just have to have a name here. I call it test model. You can choose whatever you want or just use that. And you have to have this literally there, unit test dot test case, and then the colon at the end. So that's just boilerplate. The other thing which is boilerplate, and this is because uh, there's a slightly different way that you do this. Uh, inside a Jupyter notebook versus inside a separate mo Python module. So this is just totally boilerplate here. The only thing is you have to use this name here. So that name there also has to appear over here, whatever that name is. Um, but otherwise that's boilerplate. So you've got the import, you've got this, which is boilerplate. These two are boilerplate. And now we talk about this part over here in the middle, okay? These are all functions. They're functions inside a class definition. So this is a class and we have the usual Python thing of whenever there's a block of some sort, you know, something separate scope, you have a colon. So these are all indebted, indented functions and they, are, um, they have a certain structure to them. So there's one function which has this particular name called setup. What setup does is each time you run a test, the setup uh, function runs first. So what setup does is it um, loads the model into um, a, a variable that is going to be uh, within this, this class. So you're loading the model and creating a Roadrunner instance. And then the second thing is it's doing the simulation. So now I have the simulation data available. It does it for each, each time I run a test. Then every function over here that begins with the word with the sequence test test -E it's very specific you have to have that there and then after that you can write whatever you want but you have to start with test so if you define a function named test like s1 so i'm testing s1 here what what will happen then is that first python will um uh execute the setup and then it'll execute whatever statements are here. And so what this does is it uses that function that we created before is monotone. And it looks within the data for self for um, S1, this, this particular name for that column. And it says the direction is minus one, it should be decreasing. And if that is true, and remember is monotone returns true or false. If that is true, then uh, nothing happens. If it's false, then you'll, you'll get an error that comes out of it. And similarly, that's what's happened for S2 and S3. So let's see what happens here. We can run this a couple of times and get a feeling for it. So I'll run it. And you see that says that everything is okay. But suppose I said for S1, I suppose I expected that to be monotone increasing. Of course, I don't expect that, but suppose that that were the case. And now I run it, what would happen? So here's, the, here's what you'll get back if, you, if that happens. It'll tell you the line number this happened on, so line 14. And it'll say that the assertion is false and it should have been true. And so that's what, what you'll, you'll get out of that. 
I'll just turn that back so that's the correct thing. So we'll run it again. Okay, so that gives you the testing framework uh, for, for how you um, actually construct this. Um, and then you can get a feeling, I give some other examples here of um, other things that you can test. Um, here is something which, you know, to sort of um, get a sense for your ability to um, reproduce this kind of thing is to try and think about what it is you would look at for the wolf model. And uh, we don't have time. It would be nice to do the exercise. We have very limited time here, only another 15 minutes. But I'd like to brainstorm with you about going through the same process, and it will help us sort of reinforce things. So, um, I, geez, I see there are a whole bunch of messages in chat. Um, Lucian, Veronica, uh, mostly we're, anything we're just I need chatting to... about stuff. We're, we're good. Um, just that okay. if you were, if you were uh, simulating stochastically, then obviously your tests are going to have to adjust accordingly, which is going to make things exactly, yeah. exactly, right. yeah, exactly right. Your your tests going to have to, and so you go back to you know you have to just write the right functions. Other questions? Okay, let's talk specifically about the Wolf model because you remember for the Wolf model, you know, here's what we come up with. You know, we we have these oscillations. It's a very different situation than that simple linear model. What would be some good assertions? So we have to start there. What are the assertions or the predicates we'd like to test for to make sure that we're getting something out of this that's reasonable? Any, any discussion on that? Because this, this is the hardest part. Everything else is somewhat mechanical. Once you've done it a couple of times, it's easy. The hard part is what are your assertions? I guess we would like to see oscillations in the, in the system. So. Exactly. Great idea. We want to see oscillations. So if we find that, you know, we've simulated for a certain period of time, let's see here, that says simulate. Let's simulate for a little bit longer. See, if I simulate from zero to, I guess right now is a 10 or something, a five. Let's say I, I go to 20 and let's get a lot of points. So it's a little bit smoother. Let's see what we get over here. Okay. All right, so this is the kind of thing we're sort of looking for. We want to see sustained oscillations. If we don't see sustained oscillations, then we have a problem. How are we going to check for sustained oscillations? Any thoughts? Now, we don't have, we're not going to write any code because we don't have time to write code. So think about, you know, um, those of you who, you know, maybe mechanical electrical engineering background, think back to a signals class you may have taken. How would you check for this? The, the, I mean, the uh, group, have, have Go ahead, uh, please. I mean, the ground work would be just doing the differences and see if the signs oscillate, like if they check, they, they go. You can do that. Process. You certainly could do that. I mean, the, yeah. the, the formal techniques that people would use is something called a, a, a foyer series. Uh, oh. These are available in, in a lot of the signal packages. And the nice thing about doing the foyer analysis, it's robust to, you know, to, you know, some, you know, statistical variability. So if you had some, you know, statistical variability in there, you've got, you take care of that. And, and you probably, what we're interested in is we not only should it oscillate, the frequency of oscillation should be the same for the different species. So we're looking for that too. Those are probably a, you know, a couple of predicates we might look for. Anything else that you might want to test for? I'll go back to 10, this is a little bit hard to see. I don't know, like the, possibly the, the intensity of the, uh, of the oscillations. So, so you're talking about sort of like the, uh, I'm sorry? If we are doing Fourier transform, maybe then the periodicity that is. Yeah, yeah, right. When that's a frequency or periodicity, that would be yeah. good. I mean, oh, oh, so are you talking about like phase shifts too? I mean, that that's a possibility. What I was thinking about, and maybe this goes back to the thought on intensity, is that there's a certain mag, you know ordering of the magnitudes. You know, some have yes. you know larger concentrations than others. So we might be looking for that as well. That would be another example of a predicate. We might want to do that. That one's probably a little bit easier to check too. We could look at average values rather than doing, you know, the Fourier analysis. Uh, anything can, else? Can on I this? ask it's a question so, about the Fourier analysis? Sure. The, 
So the, the suggestion was using Fourier analysis and comparing the frequencies, but uh, like, uh, do we check the largest frequencies or all the frequencies? Because uh, great, we can have great a dominant, question. Yeah. yeah, 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 right. Yeah, great question. So, so yeah, this gets into a little more detail about what a Fourier analysis gives you. So what a Fourier analysis will give you is for each frequency, it, it, it will give you a coefficient, you know, sort of like intuitively an amplitude about how intense it is at that frequency. That's what you get. And mm -hmm. so I think your point is that you may have a few frequencies that are pretty, you know. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And so, so exactly. then what That's do you do with it? Yeah. yeah, exactly. And so what do you do with that? So I, you know, my intuition about this, and uh, we actually use this example in our, our computational biology class. The way I have the students do it is I ask them to, to check to see that, uh, to give a little bit of robustness to the test, to check to see if the top frequency that's found in one species is within the top three frequencies of another species. So you get a little more robustness to it. You know, the thing is that, as you probably know, there are harmonics, you know? So if your frequency yeah. is five, you'll, you'll also see a big peak at 10. It won't be as big as five, but you know, you'll see a peak at 10, you'll see a peak at 15, you know, a smaller one at 20, you know, you get those harmonics. So you've got to be able to deal with that when you're constructing it. And these are great questions because um, this gets into a lot of the detail about what's required to do this kind of dynamic testing, because you've got to be able to write these functions that are robust for checking for error conditions. Okay, I see, other thanks. questions. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Other questions on, on this point for the dynamic tests? Okay, well, I've really covered all the material I wanted to cover, and I want to sort of leave things open at this point to um, you know, let folks you know, talk about um, questions that they have related to this material, either today or yesterday, um, this morning, just see if there are points of confusion. Because I know there may be questions that, that people have suppressed up to this point. And you may even feel it's a basic question, like, you know, well, I don't want to be embarrassed. You know, someone else probably, you know, everybody else knows this. Chances are, if you have a question, others will too. So anything else? that comes to mind that you'd like to talk about? Uh, I, I have I'm a question to... again about the, about the dynamics. So suppose we have a system yes. that is uh, acquired by like, I don't know, some kind of parameter estimation and we are uh, generating an output that let's say that the, that the output that is uh, coming out has some like, uh, like, uh, some noise on the output that is not intrinsic to the to the actual model, but it's like more of a more of a data artifact. Uh, so we are okay. gonna do this kind of like uh, uh, validity checks that we just did. Let's say Fourier trans. Like right. I said, uh, and then if you do something like that, uh, it's gonna be generating some kind of like very small frequencies that are not a part of the model, but they are a part of the like you know the error that comes from the data. So right. is, is this kind of like uh, checking, uh, like how do you, uh, I, so I guess my question is, uh, again, going back to the, uh, to the first question that I had, how do we know which one of the frequencies we should filter out and which one of them we should keep as, as like a validation? Right, 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 right. I mean, the standard approach here, you know, for this to work is that you, you're interested in the largest ones. And, okay. and so, you know, typically what you, and, and you can make that, I mean, the idea I, I maybe didn't express it well, I was talking about before, is that you know, the largest frequency you may, it conceptually in this model, you expect all chemical species have the same oscillation frequency. That's what you'd like to test for. But as you point out, you know, there may be, depending on exactly what I'm testing, there may be a stochastic element in there that makes it so that, you know, some of the chemical species also have another frequency to them that is um, maybe you know pretty large, maybe is lar even larger than that primary frequency. So how do you make that, that test more robust? And that was the idea of, well, instead of checking that two species have the you know, same 
uh, frequency with the highest Fourier coefficient, the largest Fourier coefficient. Check to see if you know, like you know, the top three. You know, there's there's a there's a non-null intersection for the top three frequencies. So it's kind of that like gives a you a little feeling yeah. based kind of like uh, like test. Like you 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 have a feeling about what your model should act, and then you just pick the the top like three or four or five as right as far exactly. As you Right, and that's right. exactly the idea. And and this is this is there's no science to this. This is an art, you know. Because yeah, and now another thing that I was going to raise here, and please, if somebody has other fundamental questions, bring them up. Because right now I'm going to get a little philosophical. But this is a discussion that I think is sort of interesting uh, on this topic of testing, um, and it's it's actually one Herbert and I have had on many occasions. I think it's still an unresolved discussion. And that is, how can you come up with these assertions when the whole purpose of the model is to understand how the system will behave? So what you do by definition with this testing paradigm is you make assertions about how the model will behave. In other words, you have to have some prior knowledge about how it's gonna behave. And then you're gonna construct tests, but that doesn't make sense because the whole purpose is to understand how it's gonna behave. So you've got a bit of a quandary there. Right. Yeah, that, it's always first, like hard to justify. Right. Like you always have to go back and forth. Like someone would ask you, well, why did you pick this? And then you'd be like, well, I had this general feeling about this. And then they asked you, how did you have that general feeling? Like, exactly. like what is exactly. the point in modeling it if you had that, like, right. you know? Plus, right, yeah. right, exactly. And and this is this gets back, this is another element of the art. Now, there, there are a couple of couple of example answers I have to this. Obviously, I don't think that they've been effective answers because Herbert and I still have these conversations. But here's one answer I have to it. And that is that um, uh, in, in software, there's this notion of a regression test where uh, a regression doesn't mean like, you know, the statistical technique of linear regression. It, it means that, you know, have I fallen backwards? You know, does what I, I is something that used to work, does it still work? Okay, so suppose I've developed a model, let's say for glycolysis, and I want to include, you know, the, the, the pentose phosphate pathway, you know, so I'm going to extend my model, make it more comprehensive. All right, so if I'm going to do that, there are elements of the glycolysis pathway that I still expect are going to work in a similar way. Um, and those are things that um, I want to make sure that in my tests, I, I haven't I haven't undone those as I add in the new pathway and other parts that are going to be different that I probably don't want to have the same test. So um, I, I think that's the kind of scenario that I sort of envision here. Or, or for example, I understand how the system works. I have tests for it because I have good experimental data. I know what it works like. And then as I make changes over time, maybe to my codes for computing you know, certain elements, maybe I want to change some of the kinetics, because I think the kinetics are sort of, of you know, unnecessarily, you know, uh, uh, some, some elements are unnecessary. Maybe I feel like, you know, Michaelis Menton is not really needed here. This could just be mass action. But I want to make sure I'm still getting the same results, uh, you know, similar results as I got before. Again, I think that, you know, it makes sense to have this, you know, use these insights from prior um, simulations or, or in experimental data to, to use it uh, in there. So anyway, that's where I think that this kind of thing is appropriate and how it fits in. A any comments on this? Uh, you know, sort of the philosophy of either static or dynamic tests? Um, the question one thing I'll say is just that I, I have often see uh, tests, you, you add a test when something breaks that you didn't expect to break. And you, you, you find a problem you fix the problem and then you add a test to fix to make sure you don't make the same problem again in the future. And it would be great if we could write all the tests initially so, so you would never have to add any more tests and when something would break, it would break a test. But that in, in practice, that never happens. Like all the things that you, all, all the things that you break are break something new that you didn't expect would ever break. Um, and so then you would go in and add a test, so. Okay, I mean that's a that's interesting thought. That you know, for example, that that first example we had with the linear pathway, where we had zero values for I guess the or I guess the un unbounded value for the inorganic phosphate. You know, we 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 implement the model, we broke something, and then that's something we could test for. So right, that would be an right. analogy there. Okay, I think there was at least one other question. Yeah, someone had a comment. Go ahead. There's one question for me by May. Um, 
regarding the philosophy that you're mentioning and also the pragmatic part because for example even in the wolf model at the beginning we had we did we did not see the oscillate, oscillating pattern and even at the start of the oscillating pattern it does not look exactly the same as after some stabilization period so my question is should we maybe while writing those tests uh, write them separately for different periods of uh, simulation absolutely i mean these are you know they're, they're time dynamics and i think what you you, you could imagine that you might want to have um you know tests for different time periods during the simulation uh, no i think that's an excellent point because we may be more we may rather know the behavior of the biological system when it's in some state than overall so that was absolutely the, the philosophy that you were mentioning about we are making tests and assumptions about the model we don't know how the model will behave every time but we know some states and have some data for that that we may predict right. the behavior of the biological system but right. in this specific state not all the time right uh, absolutely i think that's very reasonable so you're you're not talking about something that is true throughout the duration of the simulation it may just be for certain states or time periods right so that's the uh, other proper approach yeah, I, absolutely. That's um, and and proper approach. I mean, I hesitate to say that because it makes it seem as if this is a formalized methodology. This is something that we're still developing, and is certainly in the early phases of adoption by the community. So, um, so I, I hesitate to say proper approach, but I think okay. your ideas are great. Good. Thanks. Other other questions. Someone in the chat asked, "What is the right level of testing?" Oh, okay. You know what? I think it's a questions. great thing yeah. to do. Uh, Lucian, what's your feeling about the right level of testing? I feel like the right level of testing is the is that it doesn't it doesn't take up too many of your resources while you're doing it while while you're testing. So if you have some sort of automated system that like runs on a thing, great. If you have to do things by hand, you just don't want it to be too onerous. So it, it can't take up too much time every time you have to test. And the other thing is that it it should it should decrease the number of problems you find in the future, right? If you if you have a, a, a if you set up a system of, of testing and then you keep running into problems, you don't have a robust enough testing system. And then you, and maybe like instead of just adding more tests piecemeal as things break, you say like I'm finding problems in this area all the time. I should go back and like try to be comprehensive in my testing in this area, because this is clearly an important thing because it keeps keeps breaking all the time. And then if that helps, if in the future you break less because of that, then that is a right level of testing. The one other thing I would add on to that yeah. is uh, in software, there's a notion of what's called a flaky test. A flaky test is a test that tends to be really sensitive to changes in your system. For example, if you have some statistical technique that can produce numbers that could vary, let's say over the range of zero to one, and you, you do a test for exactly 0.5, but you know it varies because it's a statistical test, it's going to break a lot. And so you want to be able to have a test that maybe you know looks at a range or something like that, so that you 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 it should not be the case that you get false positives for tests. It falsely says that there's a problem. You should not get that. So you want to avoid yeah. flaky yeah. tests. Other questions? Because I think we're just about at time. At Joseph. This point. Yes. Uh, science are only true science scientists when convincing referees. What do you think of that? Oh, when convincing referees, I would say that, um, so if by referees, you mean, um, you know, reviewers for journals? Yes. Reviewers I know, I, people, yeah. yeah. So, um, I don't know. I, 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 first of all, I wouldn't limit myself to reviewers of journals. I mean, actually, for me, it, it's as important for me to be convincing and communicative with my students who obviously are earlier stages in the career than the reviewers as is reviewer itself um so i, I don't know I, I guess i agree with the idea that you have to be convincing to others um and and reviewers of course vary 
tremendously. So I'm, I'm not sure if I really answered your question. Did I? Did I get close? No, the, the point was that you were saying that we are kind of an artists uh, in the sense that we are not extremely orthodox when we are working, but um, after some point when we will publish or educate something like that, we need to structure the, all the knowledge, all the stuff in a scientific right. way. So you basically give the base after you achieved your goal, something like that. Okay, I, okay, I, think, I, I think I get the, the point you're trying to make. I would say this, what I was trying to distinguish was between the creative process for figuring out how you do testing that, that's a creative process, much as if you're going to formulate a hypothesis, because you don't necessarily formulate the hypothesis before you begin any exploration. You know, you probably have to explore a little bit to, you know, in the process you develop the hypothesis. But then once you want to prove a hypothesis, that's very structured. That's very formal. And yes, it should be a compelling argument that someone who is a you know, knowledgeable uh, scientist could follow that argument and either agree or disagree with it. Does that make sense? Yes, yes. Okay, uh, other questions or comments? Okay, well, I hope you all found this useful. Um, I guess we're, we're a few minutes past time.